Great. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this webinar is being sponsored by the Dual Credit Think Tank on behalf of the Illinois P2I Network and ILICEP. Um, today, we're going to be talking to you about the recent uh, policy proposed policy changes that the Higher Learning Commission has um, put forth. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I thought meeting. she was going to, yeah. Oh. Let me send this. All right, I'm going to go ahead and I'm um, mute. Okay, so joining me here, and we're going to go ahead and introduce ourselves just momentarily, but um, to help us get started, um, here is the bit.ly, here's the link to the slide deck um, or the QR code. Again, like I said, um, for those of you who may want to go back and uh, watch the recording and reference it, uh, please do so alongside the slides. The slides themselves have um, many links to the information that we are talking about and dissecting, as well as some resources uh, from pre previous conversations that we've had related to uh, not only dual credit, but specifically faculty qualifications and teacher credentialing and all things uh, related to dual credit. Um, just a quick uh, review of the things that we're going to be talking about today. And so one thing that Amy and I wanted to make sure that we established um, right off the bat was that what you're about to hear today uh, is going to be contextualized in, in within dual credit. Um, you know, as many of you who've been working with higher learning uh, with the Higher Learning Commission or are an HLC member, um, you may know this already, but the changes that they're being that are being proposed um, apply to everyone within the institution. And so and we'll kind of talk that uh, talk about that here shortly as well. But what we say today, our commentary, our, our additional references and resources are all within the context of dual credit. So my name is Rodrigo Lopez. I'm the director of P20 initiatives at the Illinois P20 network at Northern Illinois University. Um, and one of the things that I do on behalf of the uh, network is co-lead the dual credit think tank alongside um, membership and leadership of LSEP. Um, and joining me today is Amy. Amy? Everyone, I am Amy Galvin. I am the Government Affairs Director with Stanford Children Illinois, um, and I will get a little bit into what Stan uh, does in dual credit uh, later in the presentation. Nice to see you all today. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, and also, if if you don't mind, we'd love to know who's here with us today. So if you can use the chat, just introduce yourselves. Let us know who you are, where do you work, and what your role is with the uh, institution, especially if it's within the context or if you have responsibilities related to dual credit. Uh, a couple more things related to the Illinois P20 network, but specifically the dual credit think tank. Um, if you are not a member of the Illinois P20 network, please go ahead and subscribe to our newsletter. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to make this recording available. The slide deck is here uh, available for you to use and take back to your institutions and organizations. Um, but we're going to continue to work on this with our partners throughout the state to continue to follow this um, this, this proposed policy changes um, since we know that what we're talking about here is just information that's- uh, has... We're just on a Zoom. Sorry, just a Zoom. Sorry uh, about that. Again, if you don't mind muting yourselves, uh, we are recording this and so it'll make it easier on us to edit afterwards. Um, so the p 2 network alongside its partners and those in the dual credit think tech will continue to put out resources and commentary related to this. And, all we, and also we're here to help out in any way that we can. So uh, again, if you are not subscribed yet to the p 2 network newsletter, please go ahead by clicking on that uh, link below. A little bit about the dual credit think tank. So I know that there's a lot of you who are part of, part of the dual credit think tank. Um, it was established a few years ago out of the need from multiple practitioners, both at the secondary and post-secondary level, who needed to find a space and a setting to convene, to, to have dialogue related to very specific issues and challenges with operations, but also as we uh, kept getting legislation uh, about dual credit or dual credit being incorporated into other legislation, this group has been able to organize and ultimately be able to provide um, a consistent space specifically to go ahead and share resources, dialogue, and ultimately find op opportunities for us collectively as a state to enhance and, uh, and progress moving forward with having more students participate in dual credit. So um, if you'd like more information about the dual credit think tank and some of the work that we're doing, especially through two work groups right now, uh, please do uh, reach out. So a couple of things that we would like for you to keep in mind. Again, I'm sure that there's other things that you are thinking about that are specific to your organization, to your partnerships. Um, but as we've jotted down here on the screen, um, again, we would love to know, especially if uh, either now or after the fact, 
what types of questions do you still have for us? What what thoughts, what concerns, what things would you like for the dual credit think tank and or the Illinois P2 network um, to further look into to be able to go ahead and provide further clarity or guidance? Um, but as it relates to the work that you are all doing, uh, obviously, as you read through the policy changes that are being proposed, uh, it may trigger some thoughts and or opportunities on how you can come together with your partner um, and, and be able to go ahead and process through what changes could ultimately come about in terms of how you go about recruiting, approving, and maintaining your teacher um, cohorts that are teaching dual credit courses in your institutions. All right, so a little bit of background, a little bit of context. The Higher Learning Commission um, is the uh, accrediting body that accredits the colleges and universities in the state of Illinois, along with 18 other states in the Midwest. Um, that link at the top of the screen um, on this page will take you to the student practices. And there's a lot of information on here, but again, today what we're gonna be focusing on is on faculty qualifications. But if this is a new, uh, if this is a new topic to, uh, to you, I do encourage you to go ahead and explore and kind of get a little bit of a, um, an idea of what other uh, procedures and policies the HLC has set through its assumed practices and ultimately where to find the language on faculty qualifications. In specific, what you are going to be looking to is uh, noted within the teaching and learning quality resources and support section, uh, which we're going to go ahead and drill into here in a little bit. As it relates to the proposed policy changes um, in the timeline, the dual credit think tank, along with some of its partners that work in the higher um, in college and universities, um, uh, put together a webinar that we did early in the academic year, but ultimately that came from learning about uh, an internal call for feedback that the HLC um, asked college universities to participate in. And so uh, for reference, um, that link there at the top, the updates to the assumed practices was the initial letter, email communication that was sent to HLC members talking about what was forthcoming um, and what made it all the way to the first reading and ultimately, obviously, as we're going to talk about here, um, what came out of the first reading after the Board of Trustees had that convening in, the, in July. Uh, for additional resources or references to some of that commentary that we had early in the year, we've also linked the presentation that, we, that Amy and I did back in February, um, almost six months ago, uh, seven months ago, and um, you can go ahead and, and reference that as needed. The changes specifically can be found through this link here and on bullet point number three, um, but you'll also see them referenced throughout the slide deck here coming uh, in the next few slides. And lastly, one of the things that Amy will talk about here shortly is the letter of support that was written uh, and proposals of some of these changes and how you can get access to it and ultimately be looking to go ahead and modify it or draft your letter uh, to participate in the open comment period. So specifically to what the current policy on faculty qualifications says, again, the link at the top of the, of the page will take you directly to this section on the assumed practices. And so again, this is what is currently in existence. Um, and this is what's being modified. And we just wanted to go ahead and call out a few things because this is the common language with the common um, uh, sections of the assumed practices that as dual credit practitioners, we often look to. Uh, when we're looking to go ahead and grow our teachers um, in the buildings that are teaching dual credit or get into dialogue as to ultimately what the process looks like for dual credit instructors to become eligible to teach those classes. The one thing that I'll know, which we'll go ahead and, and, and also note here shortly, is that in the second bullet point, what we know right now is that in order for teachers to be looking to teach general education courses, uh, instructors need either a master's in the discipline or a master's uh, in a subfield or related field in 18 credit hours in that very particular discipline. And so um, that's bolded here. And as you'll know here soon, um, that is one of the changes that's come uh, from these proposed policy changes. I'll also like to note that one of the specific resources in our set of guidelines that has been available for HLC members, but also uh, dual credit partners, those school districts that are partnering with community colleges and universities, um, is the link that's attached to the top of the page, which provides guidelines. Uh, it provides uh, a set of standards 
for institutions and partners to follow when thinking about how to grow their cohorts of teachers teaching dual credit courses. Again, the two bullet points there are pulled from this resource to be able to notate specifically um, those reference points that we as dual credit practitioners often look for uh, to help us be able to make those decisions. Uh, the second one specifically uh, was pulled up because one of the changes that is being proposed uh, where they went to go about clarifying equivalent experience, what is currently known as tested experience in the, in the assumed practices. One of the last things I want to say about in terms of background and context of these proposed policy changes is that when we learned about the communication that was sent in December to HLC members, um, and as you see, as you might have seen now in the proposed policy changes that came out of the first reading, the, the context for these policy changes um, was laid out as such. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we really want to be able to call out here within the context of dual credit is that HLC uh, as an organization has been working with the Midwestern Higher Education Compact and the National Alliance of Concurrent Enrollment Partnerships, uh, two prominent organizations um, across the states who've been doing work with dual credit, concurrent enrollment, early college uh, high schools, uh, in relation to looking to enhance opportunities for students to participate. And so we thought that that was very critical to point out as they have themselves um, because I think it's going to influence a lot of the conversations moving forward, especially about how we as the Illinois P2A Network or the Dual Credit Think Tank can come together to be able to go ahead and put some of these opportunities into practice. And so I'm not going to go too much into detail here. This slide is really here more for you to be able to reference. But uh, for those of you who are able to go ahead and take a look at the blog we wrote a couple of weeks ago, this um, this provides a very brief summary or a paraphrase uh, of what's included in the proposed policy changes. Um, and Amy's going to go ahead and, and detail these out a little further. And of course, um, at the uh, at the end, we'll have an opportunity to be able to uh, potentially answer some questions, clarify, or be able to provide additional resources. Uh, but before moving on, one of the questions that has come to us already uh, a few times is this question about. Um, teacher's experience as it relates to equivalent experience. And so uh, we did want to note that specifically and explicitly, the HLC has included the language here at the bottom that's in parentheses and that says experience with classroom instruction as a teacher cannot alone constitute for equivalent experience. Um, it is one that we're still looking for further guidance or clarification. Um, it's something that is not yet included in the draft guidelines uh, in particular. Those draft guidelines are available for you uh, by clicking on the link above. Um, and before I turn it over to Amy, I, I do want to go ahead and just once again clarify that although our comments in this webinar is contextualized uh, for those that are working with dual credit, um, these changes, if ex if approved, come at the after the second reading in November, uh, would be applicable to all faculty, all instructors um, that are binded to the HLC institution. A couple of things that you'll find in the proposed policy changes um, are the following. One of the things that the HLC has removed or redacted from their assumed practices is that HLC members no longer have to move through the process of documenting and making public the credentials of faculty or those that are teaching courses. And so typically this information will be available in course catalogs or online websites. Um, and so this is one of the things that uh, no longer has to be um, it has to be a requirement of HLC members. Um, and then the other piece is related to curriculum. Amy? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, again, my name is Amy Galvin. Uh, I'm the Government Affairs Director with Stanford Children, Illinois. Um, Stanford Children is a educational equity organization. Uh, we do a lot of work in around the evidence-based uh, funding formula, early literacy, and then a category we call high school success, which includes um, access to high quality uh, CTE and, um, and, and dual credit among them. So this slide, I did want to kind of contextualize since I will be kind of giving my opinion. Obviously, we're supporting this policy and I, you know, my portion of the, the presentation is to explain 
why we find this beneficial for the, for the dual credit landscape in Illinois. Um, so I thought it would be helpful to go a little step back and kind of contextualize how we approach at stand um, dual credit. Um, so first, uh, we we believe that students benefit from dual credit courses. Um, you know, they're for all the obvious reasons that jump on college courses. They're typically low cost, um, and there's a pretty significant body of research that shows that dual credit courses. You know. Uh, give students academic confidence uh, and it can increase their likelihood of earning a degree. So we generally support these and think that there should be broader access to dual credit policies. Um, typically, uh, we say uh, some collaborative dual credit partnerships, they strengthen communities. Um, we see examples across the state where students, secondary and post-secondary all benefit from these partnerships. Um, and, and the foundation for, the, for those strong partnerships is, is collaboration and communication. Um, and uh, that they're foundational for any kind of success in, in dual credit. Um, and our last kind of tenet around dual credit is that dual credit expansion faces equity and logistical challenges. Um, logistical, I'm sure is no surprise to this group. Uh, demand is outpacing qualified teachers. Uh, you know, we are still dealing with a pretty acute uh, teacher shortage. And then if you layer that onto the very specific requirements that you would need to teach dual credit, um, that just that just makes the, the shortage even worse. Um, we also see that a lot of teachers, uh, well-meaning teachers, go and get their degree in administration or in teaching or in other fields that are then bar them essentially from teaching dual credit. And, and, um, and so there's a misalignment between teachers with master's degrees who, who may have a master's but may, may not be able to teach that dual credit course because they don't have the qualifying coursework. Um, and then, of course, um, planning for dual credit requires a lot of resources from districts, um, not just teaching resources, but space and technology and um, administration, logistics, transportation. Again, I'm sure this group is very well versed in all of the logistical hurdles that are required for dual credit uh, programs. Uh, and then our dual credit expansion has some equity challenges, um, high costs that will, of course, limit your participation from your under-resourced districts and your families. Um, we find that some marketing and recruitment messages may not reach all students um, as, you know, there's kind of assumptions made on who dual credit is for and, in, you know, in what in what capacity. Um, and then finally, some assessment heavy uh, course requirements that can also um, be a barrier for some very capable students who can succeed there. Um, so I thought this would be helpful to kind of tell you how we approach dual credit. Um, and now kind of turning to the uh, policy proposals. I, you know, let me put right up into the beginning. I don't think they're a silver bullet. Um, actually, Rodrigo, if you don't mind going back just one more for, real quick. I, I don't think they're a silver bullet, um, in particularly for some of these equity challenges that we're facing in Illinois. I don't think that these these um, the policy changes are really going to drive at the heart of any of these challenges. Um, you know, and I and I don't think that, you know, obviously they do anything to really convince people that that dual credit is worthwhile, where I do think that it could be impactful is in that logistics space there, which is um, particularly around teacher qualifications for for obvious reasons. Next slide, please. Thank you. Oh, next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, so how does this proposal advance um, equity and access? Uh, we kind of see three, three, three main pieces for that. Um, first, it opens the door for a broader criteria. Um, and I'll get into some detail there. Uh, it's again, it's not a silver bullet there, but it does open the door. Um, and uh, very importantly, it brings HLC guidance into alignment with Illinois law, um, which is again, critical for, for post-secondary, secondary institutions who are trying to navigate um, the many, many different documents and guidance documents from ISB and ICCB and HLC and um, everybody on, on, on how to, um, you know, how to determine a qualified credentials and uh, how to build up your programs. And then the last point, which I won't touch on too, too much, is just, it recognizes other measures for student achievement beyond grade. Um, and we do think this is important, um, obviously, as we're in seeing more dual credit in CTE spaces that have work-based learning, team-based challenges, um, portfolio work. Um, so just recognizing there, there's a lot of ways to measure student success. Um, so next slide. Next slide. I'm actually going to skip that one quick. So the first point is it opens the door to broader criteria for evaluating uh, faculty credentials. So on the left side of this table, you can see kind of current policy and then the proposed. Um, most importantly, um, the current policy says 
pretty pretty black and white that it, it, you have to have a an academic degree higher than what you're teaching. And in most instances, that would be a master's degree. Um, for general education courses, it explicitly says it needs to be a master's degree. Um, and then it, it does go on to talk a little bit about um, determining minimum thresholds for evaluation process for equivalent experience, but that's pretty much all it says on that. And then it does say that if a, a faculty has a, ma a master's degree in a different discipline in which they're teaching, they must have that minimum of 18 hours. Um, the current proposed policy, the proposed policy says that the institution will then maintain and establish reasonable policies and procedures. So it shifts from HLC providing guidance to basically saying an institution can, can police themselves on this place, in this place of quality, qual faculty qualifications. Um, and it says, it makes some suggestions. It says it may include academic credentials, um, which HLC then does define, and they use the same definition to say that academic credentials would typically mean a master's degree and probably the 18 credit hours. Um, they recognize for the first time progress towards academic cr credentials, which is not included in the, in the, uh, in the current um, uh, HLC guidance. And then they do um, say that some version of equivalent experience, which again can be determined by the by the, the post-secondary institution, can be all looked at and evaluated to determine what makes a, a, a faculty qualified. Um, this combination is, it is a, a step forward and that's why we say it opens the door for broader criteria. Um, what this does mean is that if a if a post-secondary institution says, no, we're going to continue to use master's degrees, we're only going to use academic credentials, and um, that's it, then, you know, they can still choose to do that under this new proposal. But it does allow other actors who say, you know what, we want to have a broader definition of qualified to explore those options and to, again, come up with their policy. Um, the policy has to be, um, you know, reasonable, it has to be published. Um, all of those things. And then it does explicitly say that faculty should be engaged in this process. And so that's why we say, again, this isn't necessarily a silver bullet. This doesn't say, you know, if, if they say, hey, our institution requires more than 18 minimum graduate hours, that could, that could, the institution could do that. Um, we think in our reading of the policy, it would be really difficult to defend a policy that had more that had higher um, qualifications for a dual credit instructor than you were holding your standard to your uh, traditional faculty. I think that would be a pretty difficult policy to defend. Um, but they could make those changes to say we require, you know, 20, 21 hours of, of graduate hours. That could happen. Um, but in the same in the same lens that lens that another institution could say, okay, we're we're actually going to recognize um, fewer than eighteen hours, uh, or we're going to uh, recognize that you could teach these courses to based on based off of your coursework and doing an individual evaluation of your coursework. Um, so it could kind of cut both ways there. Next slide. And then uh, the other really big point and thing that this proposal does is it brings HLC guidance in alignment to Illinois law. Um, so back in 2022, there was an amendment to the Dual Credit Quality Act, um, which is uh, Illinois' kind of governing legislation for dual credit programs, um, and that made a change to professional development plans. So uh, professional development plans have been in existence, I think, since about 2020. 2019, I think, is when they started. Um, and there is a set of criteria that you can enter into your professional development plan. That is that um, center column where it says until January of 23. Um, essentially, you you could those those are the things that you would have needed to have in order to get a uh, enter into a professional development plan to teach dual credit. And as you can see, a lot of those mirror the um, current HLC guidance, including those 18 hours. Um, but it, it did also give a, a path for bachelor's degrees, um, teachers with bachelor's degrees to enter into those programs as well. In the amendment in 2022, it eliminated that bachelor's degree provision, particularly because of concerns around HLC. Um, but then it did introduce a new CTE instructor pathway for a PDP. Um, and then you can see that it, it, that it allows um, people to get into a professional development um, program if they have only nine hours, of, uh, nine graduate hours of discipline to be taught. As you can see, this creates a um, this is out of alignment from what HLC is 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 guide, providing in their guidance, and I think this created a lot of um, 
concern and trepidation for, for post-secondary institutions for adopting PDPs or allowing PDPs um, because they obviously, for very obvious reasons, they do not want to fall out of, uh, uh, have problems with HLC and lose their accreditation status. Um, we have not heard of that happening anywhere, um, but I think the threat is, is large enough that I think it did create some um, concern around post-secondary partners around these PDP plans, like I said, for obvious reasons. So now with the new guidance that says that institutions could um, build a policy that recognizes um, uh, interim qualified for uh, instructors. And so now this is Illinois law. Um, it, it, you know, this is something that you know, is permissible in Illinois and that now uh, colleges will no longer have to be concerned that they're um, kind of stepping out of alignment with, with HLC, their accrediting body. That is good. And next slide. This brings us to um, our public comment letter. So um, we created a, a public comment letter, which I have a link to in um, the next slide. And it essentially lays out basically what I've just kind of told you guys is it chops up the pol proposed policy. One, it establishes that this, these comments are um, through the lens of dual credit, recognizing that you know your institutions, if you're coming from a post-secondary institution, may have much broader concerns and considerations for this policy proposal than dual credit. Um, so that's what this letter comes from, and it only looks at this policy at, through the dual credit lens. Um, we basically do a comparison of, what, of exactly what I just said, is that A, this will help Illinois expand dual credit um, among, amidst the teacher shortage, and that B, this will um, create alleviate some concerns that HLC guidance and Illinois law are not in alignment. Um, we use ICCB system rules um, to uh, demonstrate that academic credentials and equivalent experience, you know, kind of matches what our current system um, has in place. And those, you know, ICCB system rules are really, really broad, which you guys may know. Um, and it basically just says, you know, the instructor shall be educated and prepared in accordance with generally accepted standards and practices. So that's probably the most broad reading of how to how to qualify instructors. Um, so obviously, the HLC were. Um, new guidance wouldn't uh, run afoul any of those uh, rules there. The next piece that we talked about is progress towards academic credentials. We outlined that Illinois has already had this in place. Um, we're currently in the middle of collecting data on these PDP plans to see how broad widespread they're being used and um, their success rates and how many um, how many completers we have and um, you know if that's been able to expand dual credit and we're kind of in the middle of that process but we have this system built and it does seem anecdotally we've heard really positive things from the field that this is working and people are adopting these plans um, and so we outline how um, again how, how that alignment would be helpful in Illinois and then um, the periodic evaluation of faculty is something that the guidelines call for um, and I believe that was that's in current existence as well. Um, but we we did want to share some of the uh, some of the language that is taken from the Illinois Model Partnership Agreement, which has a very clear framework for uh, instruct or for how you can evaluate instructors and how that and and how you can give them then feedback. And it's something that was agreed to by both secondary and post secondary actors. Um, and uh, again, kind of creates a framework that this is something that is already working in Illinois and. Um, we obviously dual credit is only successful if you're maintaining um, collegiate rigor and, and and making sure the programs are high quality. And we think that we've achieved that in Illinois um, while embracing these three these three tenets. So next next slide. Uh, and this is the the promise link. Uh, so that link will take you to Stan's dual credit page, and then you'll see uh, an embedded uh, PDF which you can feel free to edit. Um, you'll see there is no logo on that. Um, and so you can feel free to edit it, to use it to, you could send it exactly as is, you can edit it, you can uh, use it as a foundation for writing your own comments. Again, if you're coming from a post-secondary institution, you might have much broader concerns or, and uh, considerations for this policy than just dual credit. Um, so you can use our letter how you, how you see fit. Um, your all comments are due. There's an email, just policy comments at hlccommission.org. They're due by September 18th. Um, and uh, that was, those are pretty much all of their submission guidelines. Um, I know Rodrigo had already included some, some links to the HLC policy for you to review yourself. Um, but I think, you know, with that, you know, we, we hope to have a strong response um, from the Illinois dual credit uh, community to support this policy. As I said, you know, this doesn't solve all our problems. You know, there's still a lot of challenges that we have around dual credit and we will continue to have, um, you know, challenges around 
faculty credentialing and, and finding enough teachers. But this is, we feel again from stand, we feel like this is a, a step forward and a step in the right direction. Um, and that will will help smooth out any other wrinkles that we have in dual credit. And, um, in, and I think most importantly is it in Bolden's um, local institutions and and our you know Illinois to to make rules that are going to best suit our our communities um, and I think that was probably one of the most positive things from from this um, guidance is that it empowers institutions to um, again to engage and determine what faculty is is qualified themselves rather than kind of having them be a middleman I think through some of the infighting that has happened around dual credit qualifications. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think we've got some resources there that, that all of those are live links. So you guys can click on those. Um, but I think at this point, we're probably open for questions. Yeah, we would like to take any questions that, you know, would be kind of in the context of helping us, uh, if there's anything we can clarify or any just open comments. Um, but before we do, uh, you know, to, to Amy's point, one of the things that we've been working on through one of the work groups on teacher credentialing is, um, and I, I referenced it earlier, but uh, we've been doing some exploration and data collection on the uh, professional development plans. And so we've been talking to community colleges and school districts across the state. Uh, we've been analyzing those PDPs that have been in, in existence. And so uh, we look forward to be able to put together a report to synthesize those uh, that those findings and ultimately be able to provide some additional guidance in terms of how you may be able to move forward, knowing that potentially speaking, come November, HLC is going to be putting on this. And if, if approved, there is a clear pathway to be able to practice those PDPs as is laid out in the uh, Dual Credit Quality Act. So um, again, look look for additional information, for additional resources coming your way through the Illinois p 20 network, through the Dual Credit Think Tank. Um, and if you're not a part of the network, again, we invite you to join us and uh, to be a part of this work. Um, so with that, I'm going to open it up to comments. If uh, I, Patrick, I see your hand. So if others want to raise your hand, I'll call on you or please feel free to use the chat and we'll read those questions out loud. Uh, Patrick? Yeah, thanks, Rodrigo. Uh, so I'm from Glenbar, District 87 in DuPage County. And just like a little 30 second brief background, uh, we're the first district to offer dual credit English in DuPage and then at scale. And now uh, in line with accelerated placement, we have about a thousand students taking dual credit English that are seniors this year. And we also introduced dual credit uh, speech. And we did that whole scale as well because it's a graduation requirement for us, um, for juniors and seniors. Now we were able to expand that at scale in a district with nearly 8,000 students because we were able to leverage the 18 credit hours so our teachers have masters. We made a partnership with St. Francis. We also made a partnership with Eastern. We got the 18 credit hours. Boom. That's a part of the HLC language. We got it approved. We got our teachers certified, expanded the scale. I think this, uh, if I'm just being really honest, like this reads like it was created by like a uh, community college faculty that wanted to have all the control and be able to restrict things as much as possible. So, and I'm going to point out exactly why. So for the faculty roles and qualifications, all the things that are struck out, okay, and then it replaces it with institution establishes and maintains reasonable policies and procedures to determine that faculty are qualified. These factors include academic achievement and academic achievement of academic credentials. Well, then you go to the other document. Well, what is that? It says, in the context of general education courses, achievement of academic credentials typically means that an instructor holds a master's degree or higher. Well, that is the same language as before, but before or the language continued to say, if a faculty member holds a master's degree or higher in a discipline of a subfield other than what they're teaching, they should have completed a minimum of 18 graduate credit hours in the discipline or subfield in which they teach. So before that was like, that was an out, right? So we were able to say, okay, well, they have a master's in teaching, master's in administration, they can get 18 credit hours. That was strategically removed from the language in the achievement of academic credentials. And I could understand, like, people would sell it, like, oh, yeah, now we can make it so they only have to have fewer uh, graduate hours. I'm telling you, a month ago, I was in a meeting with a psychology department, and they wanted a master's degree in psychology to, to teach psychology 101. And I see this opening the floodgates. And I think it's going to actually do the opposite of what you want. And if it's not corrected, it's going to have detrimental effects to dual credit all over the state. And I understand that the people in this room, I and I understand HLC's position. They don't want to be the brokers, the arbitrators. But by doing this and putting in local control, 
you're right. You're going to have two classes of community colleges, ones that want to loosen it up. Now they can loosen it up. And the ones that don't want to loosen it up, they can clamp down on it. And believe me, there are many more that want to clamp down on it than want to loosen it up. And it comes straight from the faculty. The faculty have a ton of power in this. And everyone here I know would agree with that. So I, I think I don't know why the 18 credit hours was re removed. I could understand, you know, a, a, a thing, but I think you, it has to be corrected. Like there has to be examples of achievement of academic credentials. There's no examples, right? Except it says it, it left in there that they can that they the instructor holds a master's degree or higher in that in that course. And I think that's really detrimental. And if, if that oversight is not corrected, I think colleges are going to use it to get dual credit out. And I know in other states, weird things have happened. And I, just, I don't want to see it happen in this state. So I think it's got to be corrected either on the HLC side or there's got to be an amendment to the dual qual quality credit or dual, you know, the act. We got to amend it to actually reflect that and other things that we need to 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 adjust. And we need to lobby for that. So that, I know I took too much time explaining that, but that's uh, my two cents. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. I mean, again, this is this is a slightly an open forum. So obviously, you know, feel free to talk and uh, it's it's good for those of us who are coordinating and helping support you all in your school district. So, um, Brian, I see your hand up. Um, I just wanted to echo uh, Patrick's concern. Uh, I think it's a very legitimate concern. Uh, Amy, I would encourage you if you're if you're truly trying to look at equity and so forth to uh, to continue to work with uh, flexibility for the uh, high school institutions that are working very hard on dual credit initiatives to be able to seek uh, opportunities with other community colleges if their local community colleges um, making it difficult. Um, uh, but Patrick, I, I just wanted to say thank you because I think you express what a lot of us are thinking. Can I jump in? So if you we don't have 18 credit, credit hours, they would still be qualified for a PDP plan and still could teach under Illinois law. Yeah, but it, that doesn't matter. If I get a PDP plan with nine credit hours, and then to what end? If I have to get a teacher to do nine credit hours to a master's degree, they're not going to do it. If I get a teacher to do nine credit hours you know, to 18, they'll do that. Right. And this, so this, this shuts that. And in the dual credit quality act, it doesn't specifically call this out. So the only thing where it called this out specifically was the HLC guidance. And that's what they always lean back on. And now we just took that away. So you're wait. So I don't explain that last point where 18 to nine, I'm not sure I follow what you were saying there. You, you would go on a PD. If they, if they, nine credit hours, they're, they're not going to go finish to get their masters is your, is what no, you're saying. No, no, no. I'm saying generally teachers would that have a master's would go on a PDP when they have nine credit hours and they would go up to 18 and then they would be approved by the college. Now it's going to be potentially, this is what I would hypothesize would happen since you took 18 away. They're going to say you need a master's degree because that's what this guidance actually says. It says, it literally says you need a master's degree or higher in that, in that area. So now a PDP starts at nine credit hours. I'm not going to be able to get a teacher. I pay for the courses already. I'm not going to be able to get a teacher right. to get a whole nother master's degree so they could teach a course. That's going to be really challenging. I can get them to take six classes. I'm not going to be able to get them to incentivize them to get a whole nother degree, when, especially when most teachers already have a master's degree. We I need see. some protective language somewhere, right? This is the way I would interpret this, Patrick, is we need some protective language somewhere that basically says at most... Uh, teachers are required to have 18 credit hours in uh, graduate level credit hours in that content area at most, which would give us the ability if a, if a college wanted to make it less than 18 in of graduate hours in the in the content area. Great glory. Hallelujah. But at most they can require is 18. So your, your concern, Patrick, is yes. right that the HLC basically yes. in this change of language is getting rid of the maximum limit that we currently 100%. have. Yes, Joshua, you said it perfectly. That is what's needed. We could, I mean, Illinois law, though, would give you more more reason to, we would have more room for maneuverability under the proposed policy than we do the current policy, though, because it basically gives the, 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 the power back to the states to then decide. 
but we can't lose the protection of the current language in the interim period. Is, exactly. is that right? Yes, exactly. It's just going to be a wild, wild west. It'll be chaos. If you don't do this while you introduce legislation to adjust that, there's, it's, you know, I, I, they're going to be, they're chomping at the bit. Believe me. The only reason that's out is because someone knows what that means, just like we do. And I will add, I think that part of that is there's so many um, colleges in the state who are going to look at this in different ways that, as Patrick said, it's going to be the wild, wild west. If we don't have um, some more consistency, uh, it could be really challenging and um, high schools bouncing around to different places and things like that. It's it, There's My not case. enough structure in the language. My K-12 covers 300 square miles, parts of four counties, and parts of three community college districts. So every time that I want to do a dual credit, dual credit class, I could have kids sitting in any one section of a dual credit class that live in up to three different community college districts. So therefore, I get my instructors approved by three community college districts because they could have kids in my college level dual credit course. Even right now, today, I have one community college district on one particular instructor that we hired this year that says she can teach education courses, all of the education courses that she wants to teach, her credentials are good. I have community college district B that says no, she can't teach education courses. She's got to be on a PDP plan because we're only going to recognize nine of her credit hours on her graduate transcript. And I have a third one that basically community college district C says we're going to do whatever community college district A does. So basically, right, it's a, it's two to one. And I'm going back to community college district B and saying, how in the world can she be qualified at your two neighboring community college districts and not need a PDP plan, but in your district need a PDP plan? And their response to me is basically, well, that's them, not us, and we get to decide. <laughs> so even with the existing protections to, it, that you're kind of indicating, Patrick, it is Wild West, if you will, to, to some degree. And to, to Mike's point there, there's not consistency between even the three that I deal with in the same K-12 district. <laughs> Thank you, Joshua. <laughs> Before Let me add too. I mean, the PDP plans. I mean, there's no, there's no hesitancy because we've heard that too. That this is again, this is a place that's bringing in alignment for PDP plans. Like how do you, how do you have a college that's accepting a PDP plan when HLC explicitly says that that's not permissible? So I, I, I hear, I hear what you're, I hear, I hear your concerns. But we could. That's something that we could fix with Illinois law. I can't fix the PDP HLC alignment through, you know what I mean? We can't fix that in HLC through HLC. This is our opportunity to bring that alignment there. Whereas in Illinois law, we could change something for 18 credit hours. There's only, HLC decided to, to create, we, we can introduce a law, everyone here on this, group, on this call, you know, this is something that we have more control over than we do in HLC policy guidance. And so I think that's, that's also driving my position too, is that this would also empower us to then take back a little bit more control in the space to legislate locally rather than being basically beholden to HLC, because again, they could write any policy they want. I think the HLC piece. Though. The, the, the HLC piece, allowing more flexibility is great. We just have to have the, I think to Patrick's point, which I had not thought about before this, right? We just have to be, we're going to, have to be very aggressive to have that protection that even though the flexibility that HLC is allowing is great, we got to have the protection that somebody's not taking that flexibility and going the other way. Exactly. Before we move forward, I know I'm just looking at the clock and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I'm wondering, I just want to put it out there if there's any community colleges or anybody from the university who wants to share some thoughts has a perspective a different perspective we would love to have that be part of this uh conversation um uh, brian uh, I, I can't find the oh, hand sorry. sorry andy go ahead um uh, yes I, I oversee um an academic division at richland community college uh, we do have robust dual credit offerings uh we uh, currently are not doing the PDP for the reason that Amy mentioned earlier that we're not seeing how HLC can permit that in the current guidelines. I understand there's new guidelines coming, so please respect that, that we're that that's the reason why we're not doing that as of yet. Um, <clears throat> I think um, we're 
we're just watching to see what happens come November. Uh, we're not opposed to expanding dual credit. We have expanded dual credit quite a bit over the years, including our largest school district does a full associate's degree, partly at, at the high school, partly on campus, uh, high school, freshman, sophomore year here on our campus, junior, senior year. So um, I think from our point of view, we're waiting to see what happens because we we did not want to be in a spot where we would run afoul of HLC's current guidelines. And we saw the Dual Credit Act as written running afoul of that for the reason that the PDP is opposed to that. Um, it's going to be a balance for us. I'm not sure if we can control what other community colleges do, but for us, we have to find that balance of uh, making sure it's equitable and available to all, but also not going so far that we're inadvertently shooting ourselves in the foot and taking away future enrollments because we have to have enrollment in order to um, <clears throat> uh, keep operating as a college and, and pay the bills, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> I think for me, the biggest issue more than the credentials is that we need to make sure that the coursework taught at our individual high schools is aligned academically with what is taught on our <clears throat> at our main campus. That way we're not running afoul of II guidelines or HLC guidelines or transferability with our university partners. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, that, that to me means more than all the things we're talking about today because I don't mind expanding our dual credit for sure make sure that we do it academically in the, the right way. And that statement is not implied there's high schools that are not doing it the right way. Well, I'm not trying to say that people are cheating, but admittedly it's harder to know when there, we have 13 partner high schools, it's difficult to know that it is taking place where all of you at the high school will probably have the same concern about a teacher that inadvertently is not following guidelines either. It's just the same concern that we all have. Thank you very much, Andy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Brian? I just wanted to uh, call attention to the comment that was made around career and technical education, which historically, for for to paraphrase one of my uh, colleagues, uh, the way they put it, has kind of had a fence around it in terms of the flexibility, um, especially in light of so many uh, career and tech ed teachers uh, being uh, non-traditionally certified coming from business and industry. And in light of the teacher shortage, I think we're going to need to continue to uh, view that as a pipeline for us to fill our classrooms. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to mention the comment that was made in the, in the, the sidebar um, on that particular issue. I think it's something that uh, uh, I would certainly like to see uh, the flexibility um that we might not see in a, uh, you know, core content transfer class. Um, I, I'd like to see those provisions in place remain. And, and, and frankly, I think what we're talking about and what I'm hearing on the call is, has this been so eloquently demonstrated is inconsistencies um, in, in terms of uh, how these are interpreted. Um, and, and uh, you know, Having been in a region that had uh, uh, more dual credit than anywhere else in the state, and in a region that uh, you know it's it's a kind of a leadership change away or a departmental uh, change away from, uh, I, I would just love to see something that allowed for more uniform interpretation. So, thank you, Brian. Um, two quick call-outs. Uh, one. Um, Again, not to dismiss what everybody has said, but just another resource that we're going to add here at the end of the slide deck for, for your use. Uh, ICCB puts out an annual dual credit report. I encourage you to take a look at that. I encourage you to take a look at the ones from previous years. In general, we have seen growth in dual credit. It's not the type of growth that we all uh, would like uh, and would prefer, especially with a lot of the work that uh, school districts are doing, but also how community colleges continue to extend themselves uh, into the school district to, to be able to collaborate with career pathways as an example. Um, so, uh, but it, it definitely would give you the opportunity to then do a couple of things. One of them being the um, the exploration of your own data um, to be able to you know identify what the infrastructure for you looks like. I know many of you have done it and we appreciate those that reach out to share your models and, and kind of your thinking behind um, some of your processes too, specifically to the program assessment. Uh, and, and two would be to be able to 
I guess, continue to encourage dialogue and uh, and not so much only just within the community college districts. So the, those school districts that feed into the school, the college, um, but then from surrounding just more from a regional state uh, or statewide um, uh, purpose. So um, we have maybe a few more minutes for a couple more comments or questions. Um, James. Thank you. Uh, so I'm new to the community college scene, so I'm coming in uh, with naive eyes. Uh, so I was just reading through the the, the document that you had sent, and uh, I, I copied in a section that I wanted to ask for clarification on. So it says at the bottom, so all that stuff that was removed, right, it was replaced by the, the idea of reasonable expectations. And then it says that the HLC will maintain institutional policies and procedures for determining faculty qualifications guidelines to further explain requirements for reasonable policies and procedures in accordance with this assumed practice, which seems to indicate that they've eliminated a lot of stuff, but it's really just going somewhere else. And there's gonna be a document that's forthcoming, which will then explain what those expected reasonable guidelines are for the community colleges in setting the criteria for um, dual credit qualification for uh, dual credit uh, being qualified to teach dual credit classes is that is that yeah. my is that a correct understanding so that is um and i can go back to that so what they've drafted is what they're referring to and that's very specific and you just called out um, those are the draft guidelines um and so uh, another another uh piece of feedback for you all working locally is to look at these draft guidelines and compare them to the current guidelines that are in place. And so the last thing I'll say to that, just to clarify, is that these guidelines apply to all faculty, all instructors who teach college courses, not just dual credit uh, instructors. Uh, but that's where you would find that additional context. Uh, we do know, as we've heard some people already reach out, these draft guidelines, as, as many of you have noted already, um, are, are fairly vague as it is right now uh, in its first draft. And so um, I cannot appreciate how much you guys have shared right now. We've been taking a lot of notes. Um, and then, but before we go, I do want to allow uh, Justin um, to, to speak. Justin? Thank you for the opportunity. I, I got in a little bit late, but we've, uh, I work in Woodstock. I'm assistant superintendent. We've been on the dual credit journey for the past six, seven years or so. And we're, we're fortunate. We work with a wonderful community college uh, with McHenry County. But I feel like over the course of the last six years, we've learned a lot through this process. And some of that is having it be fairly simplistic with some of the teacher credentialing. And to Patrick's point and, and some others that have spoke on here, I feel like uh, there's probably really good intention behind what the goal was, but I think that it's gonna really make things a lot less clear for everybody. And uh, it just really gives me great concern as we're looking to provide more equity and access for students that through unintended consequences, this might do exactly the opposite of that and might make it much, much more difficult for school districts to partner and create more of a, a unhealthy relationship as we've worked so hard together over the course of the last six, seven years. And I know there's many other school district leaders on this call too, that have really, you know, they're going outside of the, the norm by working with uh, other educational institutions, which has really benefited a lot of our students I just get really concerned if this could put things in the unintended other direction. Thank you, Justin. Well, with that being said, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is being recorded. We will make this available through the P20 Network uh, uh, site. Uh, we're also going to be drafting a, a, maybe a short blog to kind of summarize a lot of things that were said here. Uh, please reach out. Please do become a member of the P2A Network by subscribing to our newsletter if you haven't already. Uh, please, please reach out to Amy Galvin and Stanford Children to continue the dialogue and, and finding ways to collaborate. Uh, and as I said, the dual credit think tank specifically is going to continue to work not only on this to help uh, disseminate information and updates, but specifically with the teacher credentialing aspect that relates to professional development plans. So we look forward to re uh, sharing that report with you here uh, coming soon in the fall. Um, and again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Amy and I will stay back here uh, in case there's a few more additional questions or needs for us to point you in the right direction to find uh, resources or references. Thank you all so much.